Well, good evening, Pleasant View Baptist Church, friends and family, those watching us via, uh, I guess, Facebook through the uh, YouTube link. Glad you guys could join us this evening. Joined, as always, by Cameron, and we're going to look tonight at faith. What is faith? An important doctrine. Uh, it's essential for salvation, and it's often misunderstood. We Protestants believe that the Bible clearly, clearly teaches that a man is saved by faith and faith alone, or faith faith in the finished work of Christ. It's not our faith that saves us, but it's, it's trusting in what has been done in our place, which is that Christ died. Faith just means trusting, believing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to look at that tonight here. We'll be in Hebrews 11 to start off with. Or faith in something could be trusting or believing in it, even whenever it doesn't appear true, or doesn't feel true, or doesn't show any evidence of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't want to have an irrational faith. We have a faith in something that is true. It but seems to be true. You don't have a, fa don't like, have a faith in a contradiction. Even if it, yeah, but even if it doesn't seem to be true. And if, it, that, if, if you believe in something that doesn't seem to be true, but it is true, then that's faith. Not necessarily. Uh, yeah. Okay, you had faith that chair would hold you up. And it didn't seem like an unreasonable thing to ask of that chair to hold you up. You've sat in this chair before. You, you assume when you sit in this chair one more time, it's going to hold you up, right? But, you have faith in you getting behind the wheel of a car that's going to get you where you're going, and have faith the brakes are going to stop you. You have faith in things that you know to, that make sense. I think a but, person's faith ought to be rational and reasonable, not be contradictory. I think it ought to be a, a faith in something which, uh, which well, has merit. Abraham had faith in God whenever mm -hmm. he didn't have any proof that he was there. So he he had faith in God when he didn't know that he was there. Well, he knew that he was there in his heart, but there was nothing showing that he was there. Right, because Abraham trusted in God, that God could keep the promise, not that Abraham was going to do anything. Yeah, I have faith when we get home to heaven. It's not because, just like Abraham, my journey home to heaven uh, is, is faith-based. It's faith that God will get me there, not faith what I'm going to do to get myself there. Abraham just believed. He believed because God is faithful, and that's, why, that's how he had faith. Even when he didn't have any signs, well, even when he didn't have anyone, t everyone was going against it, and it seemed like it wasn't a thing, but Abraham knew in his heart that God was real, and he had faith in God. Right, because he knew God is how he had faith. He had faith he would have a child when he was in his 90s, and it hadn't happened yet, and his wife was, you know, past childbearing years, 90 or so, so that faith that was going to happen, even though all the human signs pointed no and it's not because Abraham had the power to create a child in the womb of Mary uh, Sarah excuse me it's that he knew that God could do that so he trusted not in what he could do but what God could do he had faith in things that seemed impossible yeah because God could do it which leads us to point number one faith is knowing that God can do the humanly impossible now if I just said that God can do the impossible that'd be a contradiction because if it's impossible, it can't be done. But there are things that are humanly impossible. Um, it's humanly impossible for you to find salvation, right? For you to flap your arms and fly. A lot of things are humanly impossible for you to do, uh, but God can do what is humanly impossible. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think there's one thing humans can do that God can't, and it is sin. Right, I think so. In God's eternal holy state, he cannot sin. Good point. It's all perfect. Number one, faith is knowing that God can do the humanly impossible. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assure and, assur and assurance about what we do see, not see. Try that again? Yeah. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what ancients were commended for. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. Right. God spoke it and it happened. There's, God didn't have to take another planet and form Earth or take something pre-existing to make Earth. He simply spoke it and it happened. The ancients means of the Jewish household, of, of the, the faith tradition of uh, Moses being revealed this story of the creation and all those that believe this. Um, they had they faith. They understood what they could not see. Now, the word we're looking at here in the Greek is pistis, which means faith. Uh, it means to be persuaded or to persuade. Pistis is a noun. means it's, right? 
um, it's a person, place, or thing, but not every noun is a very tangible, is a tangible object. And I'll look at this here. We'll, we'll practice a little bit tonight. So let's take a look at how Hebrews 11.1 1 is translated across three different translations and how a misunderstanding of a translation can lead to doctrinal error. So we read tonight from the NIV, which is a somewhat dynamic translation, Faith is confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about we what we do not see. The King James says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the English Standard Version says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now I want to look at the, the Greek underlying this, he, this text in the book of Hebrews. So use the ESV again for this one. Faith is the assurance a hypostasis, right? Of things hoped for, the conviction, or elanikos, right? I'm butchering that. Of things not seen. Hypostasis is the basis, basis or essence. It is the essence of things hoped for. It is the basis of things hoped for. It is, uh, it's the proof, it's the uh, conviction or proof of things not seen. That sounds a little bit muddier there. Faith is not a shot in the dark. A leap in the dark, jumping yeah. into murky water, hoping something is just true. That's not what I'm saying. Faith is resting in something that makes reasonable sense. I'm, but... say, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that either. Mm -hmm. I'm saying you firmly believe in something when everyone else doesn't. I think that a lot of times faith does go counter to what most folks believe, what most folks understand. And if even if it seems impossible... You know that it is possible and is a thing. But faith can't just be wishful thinking, like you yeah, have faith that there be unicorns just on the side of the moon. It's not. So faith is not defined by how impossible it seems to be believed. I'm saying that because other humans think, oh, that's not true, everyone else says that, you're like, oh, well, then it has to not be true. But you know, oh, well, I'm going to have my own opinion and I'm going to stand out even though. They say that. I know that it is true and firmly believe in my heart. Yeah, if you have true faith, you can't be dissuaded by someone else, even if the whole world didn't believe it. And you had faith that it was true. Yeah. Uh, that's good to hold on to that for sure. We're going to see tonight that the essence, the origin of faith, is not just in our hearts or what we hope to be true, but that God actually gives men saving faith to believe you had to have a saving faith placed in you. So, for example, faith is not doing the impossible Faith is understanding that God can do the impossible. I want you to understand that the difference is not trusting that I can do something, but that God can do what I cannot do. I want to take a little detour tonight, and because I think this particularly misunderstanding of the of the King James Version translation of Hebrews 11.1 1, has led to some erroneous or false doctrine by the Word of Faith movement. They teach that faith is a literal substance, a thing, a gooey substance who knows what it is it is a thing which um, which God possesses and that he used in making the universe I don't want to create a straw man argument here but that um, they think that faith is a thing and that we all possess this thing within us to create and that's how they think that's how they teach this idea that you have faith in you it's a thing which you possess and just like God, you can speak things to existence. You can say, money, get in my wallet, or health, come into my body, or flu, go away, or COVID-19, you know, be blown away. Well, you can't do that. You don't have the power to do that. You, faith is you trusting that God can do that, but it's not a thing that you possess that you have the authority to, to declare. And that's, this, is off, this is the big difference in, in prayer that we see in the scriptures and the prayer we see in the Word of Faith movement, the prayer in the Word of Faith movement is not pleading to God, asking for God, petitioning God. It is demanding of God. Right? It is saying to God what you want to happen. It's commanding things to happen. That is not by any means faith. That's not how prayer works. You trust that God can. So if, um, and one day, you know, if Christ does not return, Kenneth Copeland will die. Of, of, of natural causes he will die of cancer or statistically speaking he'll die of heart disease just like we all will die at some point and it's proof that his word of faith doctrine is false 
like uh, Kenneth Hagin, who was the founder of this movement, said he was going to live to be 120. Well, he died when he's 80 something years old, died almost 40 years short of that, right? He said, Every man ought to live to be 120 years old. That was his claim for years and years. But guess what? All of his, his uh, proclaiming to be well when he was sick, all of this uh, false courage, uh, false assurance did not give him the ability to live to 120 years old. Kenneth Copeland's not, not going to make it either. I'm just going to bet the odds on this. You know what I mean? All these people that hold this belief are all going to die long before 120 years old, most likely, based on the averages. And all these people show signs of aging. You know, they always, that's a joke, they say, never trust a faith healer who wears glasses. Right? Because if you have the faith to heal other people, you shouldn't be wearing prescription glasses. You, you should have already you. cured your nearsightedness. Well, here's some famous uh, people who hold this word faith movement. And it's, you should just be click on TV and you'll see Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer. But this has really trickled down to local churches. I hear people saying things like, I'm sending positive thoughts your way. That's not a thing that we do. You don't send a positive thought somebody's way. Or I'm declaring uh, that uh, I'm, I'm going to get over this. Right? Or I'm or here's another one that's common. I'm believing for. I'm believing for a miracle. I'm believing for a thing to happen. Well, that's the Bible doesn't tell you to believe for things to happen. It tells you to believe in thing, something that's already happened, like the resurrection of Christ. You believe in that. You believe in the sovereignty and the grace of God, all these things, but you don't believe for. It's another way of saying that you're making things happen by what you believe. Your beliefs don't make things happen. <laughs> Does that make some sense? All right, so let's take a, I'm going to say this. Be aware of a preacher who promises you that the way to heaven is through through your wallet, right? When you get to heaven, give him a ministry. When you get to heaven, a sure way to get to heaven is to give to me. Well, any preacher that says you must give money through to his ministry, and there's a lot of those hucksters out there uh, who take who rent TV spots, and they have you send money to them. They talk about uh, how tithing is important and un unleash your destiny, or tithing is important to, to fatten your bank account for God to bless you. And then when they say give to God, it's funny that they always give their address. <laughs> right? No, just tell me how to give it to God and I'll give it to him, but why do you have to give me your address? What they're saying is they spent the whole hour infomercial talking about how this new way is going to bless you in this thing. Now, if you want it to work, to activate your faith, you guys must give me your money. Um, I wonder what they do with that money. Well, they just get rich. They get crazy rich. And this whole idea of, of seed offering, right? Giving money to someone so that it grows your faith or grows you materially is, is an unbiblical concept. It's, Nowhere in the Testament are we told to give money that God gives us back money. And someone might think, oh my gosh, that's such a good idea. Why don't I just get rich for, you know, cheap, for the cheap? Uh, but does getting rich in this world cost your eternal life in heaven or hell? Right, no. It, it's not worth it. Nope. These guys that say, you know, send me money and God will get you rich. Well, why don't those guys send me their money? And God will make them richer. Right? If giving money away made them rich, why don't they just give me their money? Works the other way around, right? They promise that if, if you give them money, God's going to bless you. Well, why don't they try it the other way for a little bit? I, mean, I could sure use their millions of dollars uh, and let them get rich again, right? Well, it doesn't work that way. It's a false promise. Nowhere taught in the Bible that, that in any way God gives you more stuff because you've given to Him. That's the wrong motive to give. Well, just to touch upon this word of faith movement theology. There are four things that are very common to this this uh, this doctrine, which really popped up in the last you know fifty or sixty years. It's very new. Uh, the first is that humans are little gods, or humans are divine. Uh, that's not true. You're not a little god. You're not divine. There's no divine spark in you. The only thing godly in you is if you've become a Christian. Holy Spirit dwells in you. Otherwise, there's nothing divine about you. While you do bear the image of God. It is a fallen image, a marred image because of the sin of Adam. Uh, <clears throat> but you're not divine in yourself. But see, they teach this so that you can demand and declare and decree things to happen because you have the same creative power that God has. It's not true. They also teach a name it, claim it doctrine, which says if you want it, speak it, and it happens. It's also called blab it, grab it. But the idea is that if you want something, whether it's health or wealth, or anything in life, you just declare it and it happens. Okay, well then let's try that. I want a billion dollars. Right <laughs> they would say you don't have enough faith for that. 
Yes. That's always going to rest upon you. Or why am I still sick? I've been given your ministry. I've been coming to the healing That's crusades, not... and they'll say, "Well, you didn't have faith." None. It's always going to fall back on the you person. Get, well, they're getting that wrong. They're praying for what they want. They should pray. Okay, I, w I okay, I want this, but ultimately, I pray for your will. Right, I want what God wants me to have. Yeah. And, I, and Paul says he's he's been rich and he's been poor. That's Paul. In all things, he learned to be content. He's been in health and he's been in sickness. You think if Paul had mastered this word of faith theology, he would never be sick and would never be poor. But Paul said, in all things, I've, been, I've become content. The next one is God wants people to be healthy and wealthy all the time. Well, that wasn't true of the apostles. All the apostles, so far as we know, were martyred. Just look at the apostle Paul, for example, in the book of Acts. He, in, in Corinthians, we looked at 2 Corinthians last week, he talks about how he was you know, shipwrecked at sea and how he was had trouble from the Gentiles and the Jews in the church and how he was beaten with synagogue discipline. He had all these things happen to him. Uh, certainly he was not healthy and wealthy all the time. Number four, the atonement guaranteed material and physical healing, material prosperity and physical healing. Well, the, the atonement of, of, cross, of the cross of Christ does not guarantee material prosperity or physical healing in this life. We have hope for a healing but it's in the life to come, in a glorified body, not in this life, right? We, In fact, we have pretty sure confidence that we're going to get sick from time to time, and at some point a sickness will probably take us out of this world. If you believe that the atonement guaranteed material prosperity and physical healing, look at a homeless guy right. or someone in... <laughs> right, who believes in Christ. Or go to third um, world countries and find people who are Christians, and they're suffering from dysentery yeah. and plague and malaria. Yeah. They're suffering. That's which leads me to this next slide. This kind of gospel can only be preached to a healthy people in an air-conditioned church with padded pews in a first world country. This gospel does not preach to people who are suffering and who are sick. It doesn't preach well to people who are uh, in burn victim units in hospitals or have severe birth defects or children who are dying of cancer in their cancer wards. That gospel doesn't preach. You don't walk in there and say, okay, every child with cancer just, you know, Declare you're going to get better. Every person with severe burns, you know, that are undergoing reconstructive surgeries and all that sort of stuff, skin grafts, just declare new skin. It doesn't work that way. This world's full of suffering. But I'll just give you a rundown of, of the list of some of these people who are, who've made a fortune off this message. And here they are. The top of the Ponzi scheme, Kenneth Copeland. Net worth of up to $760 million. And he claims he's worth a billion dollars. That's in his own broadcast. I don't know, but I think I went to Wikipedia and I think that was one of the top estimates there. We know that he has a jet he purchased for about $17.5 million, the lakefront mansion there in Texas. Uh, so he's made lots of money and he's made, he's made his entire wealth, as far as we know, off of donations from people. Now, does the prosperity gospel work? If you send money to people, they get rich? Of course it works. So these guys wouldn't be doing it, right? It works because it works for the people at the top. Who get the money sent to them but not for the people not for the person on fixed income the little widow or widower who's broke and giving their their limited money to this guy with an attitude like that and doing things like that do you think he will make it to heaven i would say not i'm no judge of men yeah but i think it's a false doctrine and i think he has to repent of that another guy creflo dollar what a perfect name for a prosperity preacher guy last name dollar i always thought that was kind of a funny thing. He's pastor of World Changers Church International. He owns two Rolls Royces, a private jet, a million dollar home in Atlanta, and a $2.5 million Manhattan apartment. And that, these are a few years old. These are six, seven years old, so I'm sure his wealth has increased. I'm going to guess it has. But even if it hasn't increased, even if, even if he were penniless now, at the time that I put, put this information together, it was true. This is a man, again, who's made his entire living off of preaching this prosperity gospel. Send money to me and bankroll, bankroll my ministry. Bishop Eddie Long, $3 million worth of compensation from his ministry. Uh, again, these figures are a little bit older. $1.4 million, six-bedroom, nine-bath home, and 20 acres. $350,000 luxury Bentley automobile, and more than a million dollars in annual salary. So this guy's making money off of peddling the gospel, this word of faith gospel, this prosperity gospel. Another one, I'm just going through some list of these folks that are word of faith. There's John Haggie. You know, but he, he, made a, he made a fortune off the four blood moons and nothing happened in the four blood moons a few years ago. And he wrote a book saying that in this uh, tetrad, these, when these four, these four moons occurred in this cycle of time, 
uh, that something, something, it was, the book was entitled Something's About to Change. It was a subtitle. And I, I spent some time on social media for you guys have seen me do that. Um, nothing happened. That came and went, and nothing happened because of that. But did he, re, did he refund the books, your money perks for the book? No. He just made, he made fortune off that, off that misleading and misinformation. You know what this reminds me of? Me and you like to laugh at those little videos of the people that can like read people's future or their minds. Right, that's right. Yeah. Sound, kind of sounds like that. What are they called? Like prophets or false prophets, you mean? Yeah, something like that. They can tell your future. And the next one is Benny Hinn. He's a familiar faith healer. Does these miracle crusades all across the world. Uh, thousands of people go out to the, go attend these faith healing crusades. Uh, he earns between a half million and a million dollars every year. Uh, doesn't, I'm sure it doesn't include other perks he gets from his ministry. Uh, anyway, these figures are a little bit older. It could be much higher than that now. But I just I gave you a sample of some Word of Faith preachers. And the folks at the very top, when you send them money, they say it works, and it works for them. But you're not getting richer because you send Benny Hinn money. You're getting a little bit poorer every time you send him money. And then the last one. This one, this last one, uh, people say, well, I criticize Osteen, right? He's, he's a nice guy. He's got a charming smile. He's nothing negative. He's always positive and upbeat. And I think that's the that's the danger of the kind of gospel that he peddles. It's it's a word of faith light doctrine. It is every text in the Bible is designed to uh, give a false optimism, right? Every sermon is the same at Lakewood. It is God's on your side. God has your favor. This is the year that God's going to do great things for you, uh, right? It's always this upbeat, optimistic, and people want to hear that. In, in fact, the Apostle Paul warned us: beware of preachers who scratch itching ears, who tell you what you want to hear. Um, and of course, this guy has has reason to be up, upbeat. He's worth forty million dollars. Uh, he has a seventeen thousand square foot house, uh, house worth ten point five million. Now he says he doesn't get money from the church, and he might not, but he uses the church as a platform to sell his books, right? And the TV time that he rents as an, a platform to um, to sell his his book. So again, these word of faith guys, it is working for him. So I just wanted to show how at the top. Uh, if you peddle this, you can you can benefit financially. I'll say this: if you think that because he looks good, has a nice smile, which is why he's pro probably why he's so rich. I'm sure it's part of his success. Yeah, yeah, part of his success. He looks successful. Yep. If he has, you know, looks, you know, smile and looks rich. If you go by that, then Paul, you're just saying like Paul didn't look good. It says <laughs> right. So this is the Apollos of the 21st century, maybe. That's saying uh, that you would choose him over Paul. So you're not choosing his word, but you're choosing his looks. That's a good good point to make. We talked about that in 1 Corinthians. We introduced the, the Apostle Paul, didn't we? He was the author of much of the New Testament. And a second century description of the Apostle Paul, which I think might go back to Onesimus, the slave. Ball. Long story short. Yeah, bald-headed, hook nose, unibrow, spindly legs, all those kinds of things about the Apostle Paul. Um, but So if you chose someone based upon physical appearance, to be a pastor of a church, I think Osteen would be ahead of Paul. Probably. <laughs> not much to look at. But anyway, so I'm not I'm not criticizing him because he might be an attractive guy. I'm just saying the doctrine that he preaches, though it is very subtle, it is also a word of faith light doctrine. What well, I'm not saying that because he looks good, you don't listen to him. I'm saying that you need to focus more on his word than himself. Like that, him. That's exactly right. Every scripture Every sermon is the same at Lakewood. It is always God's on your side. He's your favorite. God wants to do you good and never harm. Well, that is not true for someone who is not born again, who's, who would die and leave this life and enter the next one in a state of torment and flames. That's God is not on your side. This is not your best life now. This is not your Friday, right? You die and you wake up in hell. This is a horrible place to be. Uh, as a preacher of the gospel, he needs to be blunt with people. Repent, turn from your sins. <clears throat> Uh, and if you don't, horrible things will happen to you in life to come, right? So God wants you to repent and turn it from your sins. Do you think he knows that he's scaring people? I don't know. I don't know him at all personally. I'm just telling you by his fruits, right? Well, here's a couple of quotes. I'll give you a couple from Kenneth Copeland that kind of show you um, the essence of this doctrine. It says this, God's reason for creating Adam, this is Kenneth Copeland, quote, his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did just that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not a subordinate to God even. 
Adam is as much like God as you can get, just the same as Jesus. Adam, in the Garden of Eden, was God manifested in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he said he was not subordinate to God, but he was walking as a God with the authority of a God. Now, this is what Copeland said about Adam. Adam was God. That's blasphemy. Adam was not God. Adam was a created being. Adam was a man. He was a first man and made without, without any kind of sin. Adam didn't have inherited sin because the earth was pure. But in the biblical text, he was the first man made, and the fact that he fell into sin shows he was not God. So, basically, at first, he was just like God in human flesh, but he wasn't God. He was like, not just like God, I'll say that again. He was God, he was like Jesus. He was like Jesus at first. He was without a sin nature, yes. yes. But he was not divine. Whenever he sinned, he was nothing like God. Right. Jesus was not like Adam in the sense he was a good man without sin. Uh, he was divine. Jesus was God, divine nature and human nature. Adam had no divine nature in him. It was only yeah. human nature. He was only and he human was a human nature without sin, but he fell into sin. So yeah. that means that he isn't God if he fell into sin, obviously. He was never God. Yeah, he was never God. Yeah. And proof of that, the proof that he was never God is because he did fall into sin. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. That. God didn't make Adam to reproduce himself. Adam's not a reproduction of God. Yeah. God didn't make Adam to make another little bitty God. But here's the reason why Copeland and the Word of Faith guys say this is because they want to say now, because you're also a man, you also have the right to create things like God created, meaning that you have this, this substance of faith within you, and you can activate this faith by declaring things to be. That is not true. You can believe it. Sure, I don't mind you believe this. It's no, not it's biblically, true. it's biblically not true to say that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Creflo Dollar, you can look on YouTube, has a very famous sermon that says, uh, you know, if dogs get together, what do they make? They make dogs. And if cats get together, they make cats. But what if the God had got together? What do they make? Well, they made man. You're, you know, you're not just in God's image, you're a little God. Well, the, the reason why they must twist this scripture to teach that, because it's not historically ever taught, it's not true. But the reason it's twisted to teach this is because they want to give, make you divine in some part so that the system works, so that you can declare and decree things to be, and that only God can do those things. Well, what I'm saying, I don't, uh, what I'm saying is that God created Adam, and whenever he was without sin, he was perfect. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And then he sinned. Because God doesn't make junk, right? Yeah, well... God did not make him in a state of sinfulness. You're right. And then whenever he sinned. Yeah, he fell into sin. That's what we say. Men are born fallen after Adam. So. The exception would be Jesus who came via virgin born. Okay. So the next one is faith is a supernatural gift from God. Number two, faith is a supernatural gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Arrow. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, Paul, was in, to the church at Ephesus, will say that we've been saved by grace through faith. Now, the word this is an antecedent, which refers to something in the text previously. And that's where the arrow comes in. The this doesn't just refer to grace, though it's an act of grace that God has given us something. What has he given us? He has given us faith. The faith you had to get saved was not your own. And if it was, you could boast in your own faith. You could say, God, you know, you saved me, but I had to have the faith to do it. Right? You could look at a lost man and say, the only reason he's not saved is because he doesn't have the faith that I had. I can brag about my own faith. Well, no, Paul leaves no room to boast. It's not by works. Even faith itself is not a work that we do. It is a gift that we've received by grace. It's through the process of grace, God's unmerited, undeserved favor. He's given you enough faith to believe in the finished work of his son. So you can't even brag about your own faith. So you can't look down at somebody who's an unbeliever and say, well, if you had the faith that I have, that's not the point. The point is that it's from the beginning to the end, your salvation is entirely contingent upon the grace, uh, the, the good gift that God has given you. It's like God gave us that faith. Yeah, enough faith to get saved yeah. in what he had done to save us. Now that blows my mind. But if, if any part of our salvation is based on what we did, we could boast. But Paul says, no one can boast. In fact, Romans 12, 3. 
For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith of God has distributed to each of you. Mm -hmm. The faith that God has distributed to every one of you. So don't think highly, more highly than you ought to, but think, right? Appreciate that God has given you enough faith. He's given enough faith to the church members, to be members of the church at Rome, to be saved. So you can't think, well, I'm saved, but Bill is not saved. Fred's not saved. Look at me. I had enough faith to believe this. Paul said that's backwards. We should be thankful for the faith it took us to get saved. Strong's Dictionary. So faith, faith, pistis, is always received from God and never generated by us. Faith is only exclusively given to the redeemed. It is not a virtue that can be worked up by human effort. You can't find an unbeliever and say he has faith. Now, I don't mean he doesn't have faith in a, a chair or brakes on his car. We have faith in those generic ways. Faith in the sense of saving faith. A lost man does not possess saving faith. It's not been given to him by God. It's not a virtue of human effort that you can work up to. Believe really hard. Click your heels three times and, you know, say I'm not, there's no place like home. And all of a sudden, you end up back in Kansas. Faith is not worked up by human effort. It's not something that you do to generate. It is something that God has given you. Make sense? Number three, last point is this. Faith is a demonstration of trusting God. Now, faith, it's a gift of God. And it's also a demonstration that you're trusting God. Matthew, I'll give you some examples in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came into his own town. Some men brought him to a paralyzed man, lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now let's pause for a second here. This is the healing of the paralytic. Probably in Peter's house, right? These form friends of this man on the mat come to him carrying his mat. He's lying down. And like on a stretcher, right? And they get on the roof and they tear it open and they lower him down. All those things, right? Mm -hmm. But what it says in the text here is Jesus saw their faith, meaning he saw what they were doing. It wasn't just they had belief. They had belief that was put to action. He saw their faith. And, and then he must, implied in the text, must be the man also on the stretcher had faith. Because in the end, the man, his sins are forgiven as well. Look at, we'll stay in the Matthew chapter 9, continue with another, another part of this chapter 9, 9, 20 through 22. This is Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned to her and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Bring it. What did he see? He saw the action she did, and underlying the action was the faith that she had. Right? It was a saving faith. In this case, a healing faith. The action, the thing that she did, demonstrated she had faith, and that's what he saw. He saw her faith in action. And then one more from not chapter 9 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 29. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. Right. Again, what does he see? He sees these men who are blind, crying out, asking for, asking to be healed. And he sees... Well, in this case, he also hears their faith, and that's what he's rewarding. So faith is a is, is believing, it's trusting, isn't it? So, pastivo is a verb. It's translated also many times to believe. It's to believe in something. It's to trust in something else. What gets a man saved? You know, we say to, for a man to be saved, he must have faith. He must believe. He must repent of his sins. He must confess his sins. All these things must happen before man is ever saved. But when a man turns his heart toward God and in belief, all that happens in the same moment of time, right? the same confession, repentance, all that happens in the same moment of breath. It's all bound up in the belief, right, in the action. We're called to trust, to trust Jesus with all that we are. 
to have faith in that. Uh, not to follow Christ for secondary gain because it'll get rid of our depression. Not to follow Christ because we'll have more good days than bad days. Not to follow Christ because the road is smooth and the sailing is, is you know, nice. But because he is the only way of salvation. Right? Yeah. Well, I hope you guys learned something tonight. I, I know I did. I always enjoy doing this with Cameron. And uh, we talked about faith tonight. We took a little side road, looked at some word of faith stuff tonight. If you didn't know that, uh, please send your hate mail to Cameron. He'll be glad to take it. <laughs> you can go to his channel and watch his videos and send him. No, I don't care. If you have comments, I don't mind if you jump in here and make a comment to me. I'd be glad to uh, politely discuss. I think I put on the table uh, what I know to be true from scriptures. Um, any thoughts to close out tonight, Cameron? Um, no. Can't think of anything. Appreciate you guys. Um, we'll see you Wednesday night, Lord wills, 6 o'clock, back in the epistles. I think we're in Ephesians this coming up week. So. I uh, hope to see you guys then. If there's nothing else, we'll close out in prayer. Let's close out. Father, come before this this uh, at this time, thankful that you give us the mercy and the grace to save us. Father, thankful that you are uh, God who hears our prayers. Father, you, you initiate salvation process. And from start to finish, you are the great author and finisher of our salvation. Father, we trust that you'll get us through as we trust in you. Father, for those that don't know you as Savior, we pray that you, you lead in their hearts uh, the Holy Spirit, draw them unto yourself this very day. Give them the faith that's required for salvation as you, as you uh, justify that sinner uh, as they come to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a good week and stay safe.